But what I have been working on is the free energy principle as a theory of living systems. Um, my hope is that thinking through what sense free energy minimization does or does not provide a sort of necessary principle for a single organism can be informative for thinking about the kind of collective dynamics that we should or should not expect to emerge when they interact. Okay, so as everyone at this conference likely knows, active inference has proven to be a strikingly useful modeling tool that has been applied across a wide range of phenomena across temporal and spatial scales, neural dynamics to that's on the slide, to interpersonal and collective coordination. But I, what I want to ask is, why does it work so well? And I think that's a particularly important question to ask when it comes to theories that are being applied in the cognitive and social domain. So Carl Friston nicely laid out the kind of two different ways that you could approach active inference in a chapter on the book Clark and his critics called Beyond the Desert Landscape. And one way he suggests you could approach active inference Oh, yeah. Sorry, it's very. <laughs> and one way he suggests you can approach active inference is via what he terms the high road. Sorry, the slides are being kind of strange. One second. Okay, the high road. You can just treat it as a description of a computational function that allows us to perform a particular task, namely controlling both the environment and yourself to achieve a mutually stable state. And the key insight would be that we can redescribe this overall control task in inferential terms as minimizing the surprisal of the state of the self environment system. That is, inferring some limited subset of states that can be stably maintained and so easily predicted. We can't do this directly for two reasons. The state of the environment isn't directly observable and true surprisal is typically intractable to compute. So free energy minimization serves as a computational level description of an approximation to that function achieved by minimizing the difference between the state of observable consequences and a prediction about these drawn from a simplified set of more tractable, tractable probability distributions, the variational model, which internal states encode. And the details can be fleshed out by the selection of the particular class of variational models, and then you flesh out further in specific algorithmic implementations of that, like the process. But whether or not a particular cognitive, behavioral, social phenomena will be well modeled by active inference will depend on whether it has the performance of that control task as its function which is something that will be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. The other way of approaching active inference is via what he calls a high road, which as Rislin describes it, stands in for a top-down approach that starts by asking fundamental questions about the necessary properties things must possess if they exist. On this approach, surprising minimization is not just a way of describing a computational task that we might sometimes need to approximate, it's a necessary principle a theory of everything that can be distinguished from other things in a statistical sense. One that ties existence to one simple imperative, avoid surprises and you will last longer, which as Friston puts it, is a principle so basic, there is no need to recourse to any other principles. And what can make this claim sometimes a bit difficult to interpret is that over the past decade or so, I think the way the free energy principle has got flushed out has changed significantly both in terms of the scope of the different types of systems that are claimed to fall under this imperative, and in terms of the claims made as to its explanatory power and ontological fidelity. So this is a small, but I hope kind of representative sample of the literature on this. And what I think is interesting is that if you look at the years of publication, it looks like there's been a linked move along both these axes in terms of increased scope, going roughly, but not unerringly, hand in hand with a more modest assessment of the framework's fidelity and explanatory power. So in the earliest introductions, at the sort of top left-hand side of that little graph thing, um, it's presented as an explanation of how a brain-equipped creature can overcome the intractability of true Bayesian inference. And it's specifically that intractability that motivates the principle as an explanation of how we can get around that problem. So it's presented in a realist sense as something the brain actually does and things that it encodes. But at this point, the focus is still on the brain. Then, with Frisson's Life We Know It paper, it's appreciated that if all organisms need to avoid surprising situations, then this needs to be a theory of more than just the brain. So it gets generalized to all sorts of non-neural operations of living organisms. And following that, around, I guess, the turn of this decade, there's been an increasing question of how much the free energy principle actually explains. And so we find people like Gekopovi arguing that it's best understood not as an explanation of how biological systems exist, but rather as a way of re-describing this existence as a conceptual and mathematical analysis of self-organization. Now, in generalizing away from the specific central structure of the brain via the Markov blanket, 
It turns out that free energy minimization can be predicate, predicated to both living and non-living systems alike. And as Baltieri, Buckley, and Bruno describe in the case of a walk governor, but it's also been applied to rocks or oil drops, or as Friston puts it in a particular physics, to everything that is distinguishable from anything else in a statistical sense. So there's some disagreement as to whether this principle can actually define self-organization, or whether it's just an idealized model that might be useful in studying self-organizing systems. And most recently, Patricia Palacios and Matteo Colombo have addressed this broader scope of the free energy principle, and argued that few concrete physical systems, living or otherwise, actually strictly correspond to the descriptions that they give to the system. As a result of the issues with finding concrete systems to which the free energy principle actually applies, some more recent papers, both more critical and more supportive, have begun to suggest that it's best detached from particular applications and approached, as Mel Andrews puts it, as a formal modeling structure, a pure mathematical formalism, whose applicability in any particular type of system is a separate question to be determined empirically on a case-by-case -case basis, which kind of brings us back to on principle active inference. Lots of things can be described as doing free energy minimization. In some cases, they can be described as active inferrors. But the utility of this for building models that identify the mechanistic workings of the system get determined on a case-by-case -case basis. And my impression is the general view of the free energy principle is perhaps moved much towards this more bottom right quadrant, and I think that makes a lot of sense. The more general the description is, the less it will be able to explain the specifics that differentiate one type of thing from another. But once you sort of cordoned the modeling structure off like this, what I want to ask is how well, as a modeling structure, does it actually capture properties of living systems? Accepting that some idealization is inevitable in a model, I want to ask how good an idealization it is, and does it extract highly important features, and how important are the features that it discards or distorts? Okay, so first of all, what does it look like to apply the framing principle to living system and systems, and why would you think that it is a good description of their behavior? Well, this stems from the idea that the minimization of long-run surprisal, which is the minimization of long-run free energy approximates, describes something that is essential to biological existence. And the strongest statements of this idea come from those papers that I showed in the top left-hand side of that graph, where we find Ramstead, Bycock, and Friston stating that the free energy principle is a mathematical formulation, formulation that explains from first principles the characteristics of biological systems that are able to resist decay and persist over time. And as Friston explains this, that's because the defining characteristic of biological systems is that they maintain their states and form in the face of a constantly changing environment. This maintenance of order distinguishes biological from other self-organizing systems. Indeed, the physiology of biological systems can be reduced almost entirely to the homeostasis. So a reason to think that the free energy principle latches onto key features of organisms as surprise minimizers is because surprise minimization describes homeostasis. And this definition of biological stability in terms of maintaining the stability of key variables is a move that the free energy principle shares with the early side of the link across ASCII. And I think this is a key idealizing move of both approaches. And just to flag up, one appeal of this from the perspective of cognitive science is that if homeostasis is this basic goal or imperative for living systems, and if free energy minimization provides a good description of this, then the way it translates homeostasis into inferentialist terms could potentially allow us to connect that kind of basic goal, that basic intentionality, up to ground the intentionality of more complex cognitive operations. And well, so organisms are homeostatic, but why think that that's a fundamental principle? And in particular, as the free energy principle has been extended to none biological systems, why well, I think that this can describe all kinds of forms of existence. Well, I think the idea here, and it's an idea that's also an ashby, is that homeostasis is kind of just a biological specific term for a general requirement of all sorts of existence, namely that any system that we think of as existing over time must have some invariant measurable characteristic states or sets of states so we, that we can re-identify it over time. And as the free energy principle adds to this, it must have some sort of boundary so that we can demarcate what is the system and what is its environmental backdrop. And first thing gives a neat, neat sort of summary of this definition of a system in that desert landscapes chapter, where he says, technically we are saying that if things exist, they must possess marker blankets, i.e. possess boundaries or surfaces that demarcate them from other things, and they must be ergodic, at least over a period of time. With this existential dyad, an ergodic marker blanket, everything of interest about life and the universe can be derived. So I take this definition of a system, or one of the many roughly equivalent variations of it, to be the core kind of idealizing claims made under the free energy framework. Grant this definition of a system and the necessar necessity of surprise or minimization for continued existence follows. So the requirement of ergodicity has, I think, more recently aroused some controversy, 
as it would entail the strong claim that a system's long-term trajectory is going to be insensitive to its initial conditions, so that the average state of any one instance of that system over time will be the same as the average state of multiple different instances captured at a single point. The classic example being idealized, the idealized model of gas molecules in a box, where after the system has evolved for an of time, the trajectory of a single particle will fill out the same reason of space as a snapshot of lots of those particles at a single point. And while idealicity is often assumed in idealized models, as Palacios and Colombo have argued, it's quite hard to find concrete systems that can satisfy it in a time scale in which it will be explanatory useful at least. And moreover, it ignores the kind of differentiation and individual trajectories that seem to characterize biological systems specifically. As such a more recent discussion of the Frangie principle, the emphasis has been moved to the requirement the system converges to some steady state. That allows different iterations of the system with different initial conditions to settle into different average behaviors, with the requirement only being that they eventually settle into some stable regime, not necessarily the same one. So I thought this was a nice illustration from the Guinness World Record for spinning tops. And after some wandering around, each of these spinning tops eventually settles into a kind of stable oscillation around a fixed region of their disk. So they settle into a steady state. But due to the different initial spins, they do not all end up orbiting the same region of their disk. And I think that works because the Frenetic principle, as I understand it, doesn't necessarily need the relation between the average over time and the ensemble average over multiple different iterations that a given state gives you. What it needs is that a particular iteration has some stable average behavior over time of its own. That is to say, the system must exhibit the property of having a stationary probability distribution over most likely states. And steady state gets you that kind of the most likely state for that system now is the most likely state for in the future and ongoing as long as it exists. Sorry, my computer is struggling a bit to keep up with the slides. <laughs> um, so to say that a system is a steady state is to say that must be a steady state. If we interpret this as a principle, as a description of an existential imperative, rather than just an idealization, and this implies that, as Preston puts it, things only exist over time scales within which they're ergodic, or in this updated term form, things only exist over time scales within which they can be described by a stationary probability distribution. So to say that a system must remain at, steady, at the same steady state in order to continue its existence is tantamount to saying that it cannot spend a disproportionate amount of time in high surprisal states is states it has not regularly visited before, because if it did, that would violate that requirement and change the probability distribution of a state that it's likely to be in, which, under the free energy principle, would correspond to that system ceasing to exist. So if we take the temperature of the human body, this can fluctuate over the course of the day, it always stays within a set range that can be described by a fixed probability distribution. To go outside this range would be to enter a state of high surprisal, and to stay there will be incompatible with the probability distribution that is described your most likely body temperature up till now. The breakdown of that probability distribution corresponding to the phase transition that we call death. So this stable probability distribution has two phases. One of them is a description of the characteristic states of the system that allow us to re-identify it over time. The other is that it gives us a target, that one of the key components for active inference, which is a target probability density to be approximated through variational free energy minimization. And it's this stationary distribution entailed by the system's stable dynamics that allows us to talk about it as instantiating or entailing a generative model. So I want to be careful, I'm not saying that stationarity and the requirement that a system is a steady state is necessary to pull back to inference models, but that in the current formulation of the Frangie principle, it's this idea of what defines a system that is used to guarantee that all systems can be described as surprise or minimizers. So I want to emphasize that the requirement of stationarity of the probability distribution over most likely state does not preclude the system changing. There can be various alterations and changes in the development towards a steady state, there can be temporary fluctuations away from the most likely state, as long as they're counteracted by a surprise or minimizing flow back to more likely states, so just to preserve the probability distribution. So you can occasionally visit states you haven't visited before, you just can't stay there too long, <laughs> um, because then it becomes no longer accurate to describe them as surprising, and your probability distribution changes. There can also be cycles and periodic changes around a set of equivalently likely states, which gets described by this sort of optional solenoidal component of the system's flow, which is that curved arrow around that landscape. Um, and it's been suggested that can be used to formalize a system that's at non-equilibrium and might be what differentiates living from non-living systems. So we can have all sorts of wandering around and temporary excursions from that peak of most likely state. But as Friston, Hobson, and Moise describe it, a personal particle is never off this manifold. The kind of novelty that would correspond to a permanent phase transition from one stable attractive landscape to another amounts on this formulation of a system as that system ceasing to exist. <laughs> 
The dissolution of the attractor and the potential emergence of a new regime corresponds to the death of the system as its failure to adequately deal with environmental perturbations. Okay. So to get free energy from resonance on the table, it's not enough just to have a stable probability distribution. You also need to split a system into parts so that we can talk of internal states as minimizing free energy with respect to sensory ones to control external ones. In a case of brain-bound free energy minimization, we can just take the sensory motor interface. But to generalize this to all systems involves formalizing the idea of a boundary for perception and action. This is done by the Markov blanket, which decomposes the system into internal, external, and blanket variables based on the requirement that the probability of internal variables being in a particular state is independent of the state of external variables conditional on knowing the blanket states, and vice versa. So the second presumption of the Frangie framework is that any system can be factorized in terms of these kind of conditional statistical independencies between internal and external states. And while Markov blankets and directive graphs like this are typically constructed based on statistical information, not causal information directly, these graphs can be, and in the free energy framework typically are, presented as certain patterns of causal influence. And examples of things that could be Markov blankets are physical boundaries, such as the membrane of a cell or the states of a sensory epithelia. There's some issues with that, but I don't want to get into the sort of thought, the weeds of the links in, between statistical and causal influence here. What, can, what is important to me is this claim, which is that as a consequence of requiring a fixed Markov blanket is the requirement of stable patterns of interaction between the parts of the overall system and its environment. So as Christian puts it, it does not easily accommodate the fact that the particles that constitute a Markov blanket can over time wander away or be exchanged or renewed. A canonical example here being the blanket states of a candle flame whose constituent particles, the molecules of gas, are in constant flux. Because of this flux, so Christian says, a candle flame cannot be more possessing a Markov blanket. So to kind of summarize, I think the two core moves of the Frangie principle that get you this requirement of surprise minimization is to describe a system in form of two sorts of stability. There's the requirement of stationarity, that the probability of density over the states of the system is invariant over time. Whatever state the system is most likely to be in today is the state it is most likely to be in as long as it exists. And the requirement of a Markov blanket, so that the patterns of interaction between parts of the system are stable enough we can identify some fixed subset separating the system into fixed internal and external parts and this on that blanket so and there are some like different ways of formulating this but i take it that most of them amount to different ways of expressing these key stability requirements so what we have is not an explanation of how a system biological or otherwise avoids death or ceasing to exist but as you have described it a formal analysis a potential formal analysis of what avoiding extinction is so that how this is achieved can be described by specific process theories. If we define a system in these terms, then the minimization of surprise will indeed be a necessary principle for that thing to continue to exist over time, which with some extra requirements can allow you to model that system as an active inference agent. But what I want to argue is that while these requirements may characterize stable physical systems relatively well, they're at odds with the very characteristics that distinguish living ones. So the first issue with this formulation is that as it applies to living systems, is that not all phase transitions in an organism correspond to that system dying or ceasing to exist. Organisms typically undergo many transitions from one steady state regime to another over the course of their lifespan. Examples like embryogenesis and development can be interpreted as stages on the path towards a steady state that characterizes the adult organism. But even once adult form has been achieved, organisms are liable to undergo further phase transitions that don't, on an ordinary understanding, amount to their death. And these midlife crises are not unique to complex, highly cognitive creatures like ourselves, nor do they only occur at the population level of natural selection. Sometimes reference gets made to a caterpillar turning into a butterfly as an interesting exception to our surprise and minimizing imperative. But these phase transitions are ubiquitous. There's the case of the short-horned grasshoppers that when overcrowded turn into locusts, or the apparently like 500 different species of fish that change sex under a variety of different circumstances. And we might break these down into parts and treat them as the result of competition between different Suborganisms, each with their own steady state behavior. But even the simplest single celled organism, like an E. coli bacterium, can deliberately engage in well, can be observed to <laughs> survive behavior that involves the transition from one steady state regime to another. Typically, it's flailing around between glucose, mod glucose mod molecules to keep its intake stable, could be characterized by the Frangie principle of steady state formulas. When glucose levels drop and lactose levels rise, it can switch its behavior to begin metabolizing lactose instead. That means a change in the probability distribution characterizing the equalized behavior from a low probability of lactose metabolism to a high one. And now 
what E. coli bacterium looks like it's trying to do is minimize surprise and loss to lactose intake levels instead. And so long as lactose remains available, an E. coli bacterium can do very well in this new regime. So it doesn't seem well characterized as a temporary deviation away from steady state that needs to be countered. It's this sort of adaptability and phenotypic, plas phenotypic plasticity that is not well described by the idea that a system wanders around a fixed tractor. And the analysis of a system's characteristic state in terms of a stationarity probability distribution fails to characterize the continuity of the organism throughout this transition from one steady state regime to another. So that can be made less of a problem if we drop the idea that a stationary distribution has to characterize the entire existence of a system and instead take it to characterize the stability of a temporary phase of the system and the overall process of life as a process of transitioning between steady states. And we, can, we could put that in Cunian terms to say that the Frazier principle might be a good description of how the organism maintains itself during the normal science phase, but not of the paradigm system of adaptation. Still, this leaves perhaps the most interesting properties of organisms unexplained. As a number of authors valued, both as criticisms of and independently of the Frazier principle, it's precisely the preservation of a system's identity through changes in its phase space and the capacity for permanent cumulative change that this unlocks that distinguishes the biological from the merely physical. An emphasis on this kind of historical change is, as De Paolo, Thompson, and Bayer have recently noted, the hallmark of the inactive approach to living systems, and something that potentially limits the compatibility between these and the Frazier principle. Moreover, just as not all phase transitions are equal depth, neither are all steady states equal. And the fact that a state is, can be stably maintained does not make it optimal or even viable. When a bacterium like E. coli transitions to lactose metabolism in a lactose-rich environment, this seems like a pretty optimal new steady state. But an alternative response to nutrient deficiency and other species of bacteria is to enter a dormant endospore state, and that dormant state can be maintained for millions of years. While we might describe the E. coli chowing down as lactose as thriving in its niece, that doesn't seem apt for the endospore states. And similarly, say the transition from life to being frozen cyrogenesis is a transition between steady states. But like becoming a vegetarian, this new steady state isn't a viable one for organisms like you and me. So what we want and what is not there in the Frangie principle is an explanation of which steady states are conducive to organism survival and which others are not and why. So the second stability requirement is that of a stable boundary. And if we approach that as an idealization, and I apologize for like the A-level biology diagrams here, I just thought they were quite nice and simple. Um, if we approach that as an idealization, like the requirement of stationarity, it wouldn't require that the particles constituting the marker blanket never change, but that they are at least stable on long enough timescales to be treated as invariant, and that their turnover isn't of significance in understanding the features of the system that we're interested in. The problem for living systems is that this means ignoring the distinctive manner in which they're not only in continuous material turnover on timescales shorter than the life, their own lifespan, but the ways in which that kind of material turnover is actually constitutive of the kind of behavior that we seek to explain. For specific examples, we can take the cell membrane, which is often presented as the archetypal example of a stable Markov blanket between the interior of a system and its exterior. This may be more stable than the candle flame, but in all cells, it will still be in a kind of molecular flux throughout the cell's life cycle. Um, there's the continual endocytosis and exocytosis of this membrane for regeneration, for growth, and for particle transport in and out of the cell. And this destruction and regeneration of the boundary is not an accidental quirk, but a constitutive part of how the cell maintains itself. In an example I particularly like of the cellular slime model, the regeneration of this membrane could be key to locomotion as a process of taking the membrane from the trailing edge and then regenerating it back out at the forward edge, which can result in complete turnover of the entire membrane in potentially the space of just a few minutes. And that turnover of the membrane actually enables the slime model to move. That, that material turnover is part of the behavior. So as in the case of the candle flame, this flux of molecular parts can't easily be accommodated in a model that requires fixed relations between stable parts. But the point isn't just that the Frangie principle's definition of a system abstracts away from some specific behaviors of living systems, but that these behaviors and the way in which biological systems are somehow preserved through this material turnover are, I'd argue, exactly the properties that are key to understanding the unique self-organizing behavior of life. So material turnover is not just a coincidental quirk of some organismic operations and parts like the membrane, but constitutive of living systems as metabolic systems that need to continuously regenerate themselves. Living systems are not only open and out of equilibrium with their environment, not just amenable to the possibility of incorporating flows of matter and energy. They are systems that depend on such a flow for their ongoing existence. 
And this point about the priority of metabolic turnover in characterizing living systems, which I think that's made by the philosopher Hans Jonas around 70 years ago, in his critique of Aspie's cybernetic formulation of survival, which was framed, as I said, in very similar terms to the free energy principle. And as Hans Jonas argues, organisms are distinguished by standing in a kind of needful freedom to matter, both liberated from any specific physical base, but in need of continual flows to reconstitute themselves. The free energy principle's description of a system describes a stable coupling between feedback mechanisms very nicely. But as Vanish and Kirchhoff, who, um, his name is Vanish and Kirchhoff, Michael Kirchhoff, have, Thomas Van Ness and Michael Kirchhoff, there we go, um, have recently noted, it's a modeling structure that's not well suited to capturing this precariousness. And this is not due to, due to the requirement of a stable Markov blanket, but a more basic consequence of a general modeling framework that describes systems in terms of variables and their influences upon each other to maintain a stable set of states. And this is, all of this isn't to say that there's no way to characterize some sort of biological identity that wrote remains invariant to the chains of both typical states and material substrate. substrate. Free theoretically, we do this all the time. It's just that relations of influence between atemporal fixed networks and variables are not able to capture this. To model metabolic turnover, as the theoretical biologists Matteo Mossio, Alvaro Reno, and Mayo Monteville describe, and they're building on the work of Strick Kaufman, what is needed is not just relations of statistical or causal influence between variables, but relationships of existential dependence between precarious constraints or catalysts that both depend on and enable the processes of production that regenerate them. In outer poetic and activist terms, an organism is not just an operationally closed system defined by a set of op cycle of operation to a fixed set of characteristic states, but an organizationally closed one. Here, each component is not constrained by a characteristic state or physical instantiation, but only the role it plays in the overall network. And as long as that role of constraint or regeneration is maintained, as long as this closure is preserved, the parts of the network may exchange and adapt and evolve into whatever variety of new forms states and characteristic behaviors are compatible with that closure. So, conclusion. Free energy minimization is a necessary condition only for systems defined by stability of the probability distribution over the states and the stability of interactions between their parts. Organisms may continually meet these requirements at points, but neither is necessary. The very thing that distinguishes them is their freedom from and ability to persist through transformations of both. Their relationship to the environment does not reduce to responses that preserve a stable coupling, but an asymmetric symmetric dependence upon the environment due to the continual flows of matter and energy. The point is not just that the free energy principle is too general to describe living systems and needs supplementation by additional requirements, such as temporal depth, information length, or non-equilibrium, but that the features it highlights are the ones that living systems are actually defined by the violation of. And so it may ironically be much better at describing non-living physical objects as stable coupled systems and biological organisms. So if the most basic goal of an organism is to preserve, preserve its continued existence, then this proto-normativity, if you want to treat it as a locus of proto-normativity, is not well formalized by and can be directly opposed to the preservation of a steady state and a market blanket. For free energy minimization itself cannot describe the existential imperative that organisms must follow. But despite this, I'm not saying that modeling, modeling systems, both living and otherwise, as free energy minimizers, isn't useful. As, as we've seen, like an extensive amount of work and active inference that demonstrates otherwise. A lot of organismal behavior, although far from all of it, is describable as homeostasis of a steady state. But if these kinds of stability aren't necessary survival or survival, then why would this work so well? Well, as Giuseppe Longo and Stuart Kaufman, among others, have argued, it's this openness of organizationally closed networks networks, the cumulative historical change, and the difficulty of pinning down and identifying invariant features that can make it particularly difficult to predict their evolution. If not impossible, then at least inordinately more difficult than for physical systems. But it's not only us as external observers that want to, be pre to predict what will be compatible with a system's ongoing existence. Living systems themselves need to do this. If free energy minimization is an idealization, then it still makes sense as one that we, as living systems, can actually implicitly use to estimate what will be good for us in a kind of terms of a kind of conservative stick with what you know strategy. As a living system, your identity may only be contingently associated with a particular physical form and pattern of behavior. But given that this particular instantiation has worked for you up till now and served your metabolic needs up till now, stably maintaining it in the hope that we'll continue to do so in the future is not a bad strategy. It's just not a sore fire necessity. Okay, and that is my talk. Thank you so much for listening.
Uh, thank you, Tony. That was absolutely brilliant. I'm going to let Pierre um, take the questions now. Uh, thank you, Kate, for the presentation. I find it uh, reassuring that uh, acting defense theorists uh, take seriously some of the best uh, inactivists point, which you did. So thank you. I have a uh, dual question, which is, um, so in your opinion, uh, the Fredrick principle is a potentially useful idealization for uh, the linguistic system, if I understand. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think it is explanatory? If it is, in what sense and of what? Yeah, so I think basically it's, it's useful for modeling homeostasis, for modeling um, how you respond to modeling response to perturbations to remain stable, um, but not useful for modeling adaptations when it comes to a strategy or a particular way of responding to perturbations, no longer working for you and the need to move to a new regime. So, and it's not useful for modeling, I don't think, metabolism, um, which I kind of take it to be what homeostasis, what the maintenance of stability subserves, so that metabolism is prior, homeostasis is for metabolism, and surprise minimization, described by energy minimization, can describe what being homeostatic looks like. But it's not going to get at the difference between the homeostasis of a biological system where that's important for the preservation of existence in a different way from which stability is important for the preservation of other physical systems. If you could just repeat his question very briefly to us so that we know what you're answering to. Sure. So I guess the, the kind of key thing that I took away from that was the question about um, if we can describe out of what systems using the frame energy minimization framework and how do I think about whether or not that's an observer dependent kind of projection and the difference between when it's observer dependent projection and when something's really doing whether or not it makes sense to say something's really minimizing for energy versus it's useful for us to describe it that way. Is that picking up on the key point? Great, cool. Um, so I think that's exactly what I'm concerned about um, with this talk because I didn't talk much about Hans Jonas here, but I think for me, to start talking about things as having intentions, as trying to do things as being agents, that is all going to be grounded in being a system that has the precarity of being a metabolic system, a system that whose continued existence depends on its own activity in a way that I think metabolism characterizes. I don't think energy minimization does because you can describe all sorts of systems as energy minimizers that don't have that kind of precar precarious relationship to their own activity. Um, so the difference for me, I think, would be that you can talk about a system trying to do things, trying to preserve itself, following imperatives and all that kind of thing, only once it's a metabolic system. And then the imperative that it follows might be to minimize the price, but it's only genuinely trying to do that because its existence depends on it in the way that a metabolic system does, and in a way that things like coupled pendulums don't. Are there any other questions? Stephen? Thanks. Yeah, I was just um, going to ask, what do you think about the difference between a thing and a system? Um, because a thing doesn't have to make a system per se. And, um, and also, where using variations in the process of minimizing free energy might be enough to get information to do stuff, even if it's not the stuff isn't always about directly going to a minimum of free energy at that time. I wonder what your thoughts are on, you know, the difference between a thing and a system where maybe it's important to distinguish and where it's not always about minimizing, but using the process of minimizing to get information. Yeah. So in terms of the distinction of a thing and a system, um, that's not something and something I've been thinking about a bit in terms of when you think about how you describe systems, you sort of partially describe them in terms of their dynamics as, as a process and partially in terms of their constituents and whether a system is defined as a process or the thing that realizes the process is something that I've been thinking about. I don't really have, I think, a whole lot to say about it, except that I think when you're characterizing properties like closure or self-production, what you're really characterizing is a process. Um, 
So to say that a system is closed in a particular way is never really to say that the thing that realizes that process is closed in that way. So when you say that, for example, a living system is one that is, or an operation closed system is one that's closed to perturbations that would take it outside its characteristic set of states. It's not that the thing that you're describing is isolated or invulnerable to those. It's that it only the thing only realizes that particular system as long as that's true of it. Um, so I, I guess I'm interested in the idea that when we talk about things as systems, we're talking about them more as processes than as substances, I suppose, as physical realizers. Um, but I don't have much more to say on it than that. Um, I can't remember the other part of your question. Oh, the other, yeah, I mean, the other part is about whether minimization has to be the main route to everything, i.e. there might be a minimization process, but in minimizing, you might just get a route to variations, which might then give you a route to something else, as opposed to it being, I suppose that starts to bring in the process theories a bit more, but, uh, I, but you're focused mostly on the focus on minimizing, isn't it? On getting to a minimum of free energy. Would you say that what if it's not always, it's just using that process to do something else? Is that what you mean by metabolism? Yeah, so if I understand, I think that's what I want to say, that um, if we think of maintaining a characteristic set of states as definitive of some physical object existing over time, um, then that can be described by minimization of surprise or minimization of energy and approximation. Um, but the, when an organism does that, that's, yeah, that's for something else, that's for maintaining the kind of um, intake that it needs to support its metabolism. Um, so yeah, it's like a useful tool to achieve a different goal. It's not that the minimization of energy is the fundamental imperative. It's sort of like a useful way to do something that's what you really, really do want to be doing. Nice, thank you, that helps. <laughs> Anyone else? <coughs> um, if there are no more questions, uh, we're about uh, at the end of time. Uh, um, thank you, Kate. Uh, it was a great talk. <laughs>